and this was a significant event. More than 1,300 flights were canceled and more than 9,500 were delayed. Prior to leading the FAA, Mr. Nolan served as the head of the FAA's Office of Aviation Safety with over 1 million registered aircraft, over 1 million active pilots, and over 50,000 flights every day. The Aviation Safety Office has a very big job. As an experienced airline pilot, Mr. Nolan understands the importance of the NOTAM system. These notices provide real-time safety information, flight operations, and with, without access to this information, safe aircraft operations really are not possible. This hearing, like last week's, which uh, I believe still shows the investment in technology that needs to be made, um, Southwest could have updated their system and didn't, and a critical event happened. Now we want to make sure a critical event like happened with our NOTAM system also doesn't happen. And how do we keep our economy moving forward? These incidents are concerning. They impact Americans' confidence in our aviation system, and our aviation system infrastructure is critical to Amer American safety and security. So we need to accelerate building a national airspace system for the 21st century, something this committee is going to work on as it relates to the FAA reauthorization bill. And the 23 uh, authorization bill will give us many opportunities to talk not just about this issue, but other issues, but our appropriator colleagues also have to do their job. Over the last several years, Congress has met or exceeded the administration's budget requests for the FAA facilities in NOTAM, but Mr. Nolan will talk today about additional funds, why Congress needs to paint, why a clear picture needs to be painted about the needs of our airspace system for the future. To be sure, the FAA must have redundancies and not a single point where a failure can happen in a key system like we just saw. And we have to have a responsibility to ensure that every taxpayer provides, that every taxpayer is provided a maximum value on return. Therefore, we must see clearly the obstacles ahead and what a path to make sure that we have this most modernized system. Today's discussion on NOTAM and national airspace are really part of a bigger picture. I'm sure there will be other issues that come up today as events of the last several weeks have pointed out the roles of FAA in our airspace system, working with DOD and others. So we look forward to the questions and opportunities to have you before the committee to address these important, timely questions. I'll now turn to the ranking member, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, Acting Administrator Nolan, for being here. Uh, while I look forward to hearing from you, uh, I have to say I'm disappointed by the absence of a Senate-confirmed witness like Secretary Buttigieg. Uh, who ultimately oversees the agency responsible for the NOTAM failure. And I would note that Secretary Buttigieg, in my view, instead of engaging in politics, should be focused on the job he has now and addressing the very serious transportation crises we are seeing playing out across the country. On the afternoon of January 10th, the FAA's notice to air mission system failed. About 15 hours later, after failing to reboot the system, the FAA ordered a full ground stop of the national airspace system for the first time since September 11th, 22 years ago. The ground stop was because America was under attack. But this time, this ground stop was the result of a federal agency's inability to modernize despite Congress providing the required resources to do so. The Washington Post called the ground stop, quote, almost unprecedented and said the FAA, quote, learned long ago their systems were dependent on rickety foundations, but didn't do enough to update technology. Despite a similar outage in 2008, the FAA still has not improved the system. A technology specialist involved in the 2008 outage blamed, quote, organizational inertia, something I've heard many times before when people describe problems at the FAA. The Wall Street Journal said, quote, given the importance of the FAA's mission, this kind of failure is hard to excuse. If glitches happen all the time, why doesn't the FAA have redundancy? Canada's NOTAM system, offer it, operated by a nonprofit, experienced apparently unrelated problems the same day as the United States, but planes there kept flying. The NOTAM breakdown last month was clearly a mistake. I fear it is emblematic of a culture afraid to innovate, stuck operating inefficiently, and illustrative 
of why President Biden needs to choose an administrator for the FAA with a proven ability to manage change within large organizations and with the requisite aviation and safety experience. The current nominee that is pending lacks that aviation experience. The FAA's safety mission, Mr. Nolan, as you know well, is too important to take for granted. There's a front page story in the Wall Street Journal today on the FAA's inability to modernize NOTAM. In that story, an FAA spokesperson claims that prioritizing NOTAM upgrades wouldn't guarantee funding from Congress. That's simply not true. Congress has fully funded NOTAM modernization for more than 10 years. Every year since 2013, Congress has given as much or more than the amount requested by the executive agency for 10 years now. And yet, full modernization is still several years away. After investing millions of dollars, I'm wondering why this bureaucracy is taking so long to do its job. And is the system worth modernizing at this point? Because the status quo simply isn't acceptable. There must be accountability when an agency is not using taxpayer funds efficiently. And that, of course, starts with an accountable leader. Now in his third year as Secretary of Transportation, Secretary Buttigieg has failed to deliver any meaningful reform at the FAA. Although NOTAM modernization started a decade ago, this administration seems focused on semantics. Whether it's replacing the term mother with birthing person, or creating a new checkbox on passports for people who claim to be neither a man nor woman, this administration's desire to signal its virtue seems to know no limits. It's even infected the FAA. Instead of it focusing on safety, the FAA and DOT were working hard to change NOTAM's name from Notice to Airmen to Notice to Air Missions. I would suggest instead the focus should have been on making sure the damn thing worked. Shockingly, renaming NOTAM didn't prevent an outage. You know, way back in 1994, Al Gore proposed to reform the FAA into a self-funding, more efficient organization. Today, the flying public is stuck with a self-regulating and flailing agency stuck in the 20th century. It is my hope that we can use this hearing in the 2023 FAA reauthorization bill to explore meaningful reforms to the FAA and its air traffic organization. And, and let me say finally, in recent weeks, we've seen several very concerning near misses that were almost mass fatality crashes. We've seen them in New York. We've seen them in Austin, Texas. We just recently saw one outside of Hawaii. I know Texans and Americans across this country are deeply concerned about these near misses. And I hope in addition to addressing the failure of the NOTAM system that Mr. Nolan, you will also address these near misses why they almost killed hundreds of people, and what more can be done to make sure that the next near miss doesn't become a horrific tragedy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Now we'll hear uh, from the ranking member of the subcommittee, Senator Moran. Chairwoman, thank you. Thank you, you and Senator Cruz for this uh, hearing. Uh, I am pleased to work beside you and with you and the other members of this committee as the ranking member of the Aviation Subcommittee on commerce, science, and transportation. Kansas is the aviation capital of the world with over a century's worth of rich aviation history. Whether manufacturing the first bomber in the B-52 or the next generation a bomber in the B-21, Kansas has driven and carried the aviation industry. Clusters of manufacturing, navigation, uh, alongside academia and research in Kansas leads the aviation industry into the future. Yet the FAA is at a crucial junction and we must do everything in our power to ensure the United States remains a leader in the aerospace innovation and safety. It's imperative for this committee to pass a long-term reauthorization. Prior to 2018, we had short-term reauthorizations totaling 28. It's no wonder there is uncertainty at the FAA and in the industry when we are so challenged in getting our work done. Multi-year reauthorizations 
is necessary for long-term planning and growth in the civil aviation industry, including maintenance and modernization of aviation infrastructure and technology. I look forward to addressing the current backlog at the FAA. I agree with Senator Cruz that the FAA needs a Senate-confirmed leader. We need to be able to address new technologies that are rapidly advancing so that the United States remains at the forefront and remains competitive in this world. I've worked with the chairwoman of this subcommittee on advanced air mobility in the past, and further, we've worked together in advancing the aviation workforce. We have significant challenges in the area of general aviation and aviation in general. The FAA is a significant component of that circumstance, needs our help, but it also needs to get its act together. Madam Chairman, I have altered my subcommittee assignments within the Committee on Appropriations to add THUD transportation uh, to this uh, opportunity to try to make a difference in this arena. And uh, so I look forward to uh, really working with what I think is the kind of both points of view that's been expressed so far, uh, leadership at the FAA and the necessary resources for them to do their job well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that leadership and working with, with all of us. I just want to note before we go to the witness that no TAM stood for notice to airmen. And I know while people are somewhat bothered or think that this is, is not a change, or some people are saying that it's you know being too politically correct, we have a barrier problem here. We need more women in aviation. And uh, fewer than 10% of the licensed pilots are women, about 5% of airline pilots, 3.6% of airline captains. So I just want to say how proud I am that the two naval aviators that flew over the so Super Bowl were from Whidbey Island and Whidbey Island Air Station. But I do think the changing is in the right direction and we need to do more to encourage more women in aviation. So, Mr. Nolan, welcome to today's hearing. Your uh, opening remarks, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Cruz, and, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide clarity on the FAA's management of the notices to air mission system, share details on recent events, and explain our efforts to modernize the NOTAM system. Today is also an opportunity to discuss the modernization needs of the national airspace system overall, some of the challenges we face and some of the opportunities on the horizon. We are experiencing the safest period in aviation history, but we do not take that for granted. Recent events remind us that we cannot and must not become complacent and must continually invest in our aviation system. I know we're here to discuss the challenges we experienced with our NOTAM system last month, so I want to provide a brief background about what we know so far. Late on January 10, NOTAM applications and services became unreliable. Technical experts attempted to address the issue by, among other things, switching to the backup database. While technical experts worked through the night, the FAA activated a hotline to provide real-time status updates to airspace users. During this time, there were no reports of operational impacts. In the early morning hours of January 11, the system appeared to have been restored, but formatting issues persisted. To resolve this, FAA's air traffic leadership directed the rebuild of the databases. As the morning air traffic rush approached and work on the system continued, I ordered a ground stop at approximately 7.15 a.m. Eastern time, pausing all departures in the United States in order to maintain safety and preserve predictability. I did so after consulting with the airlines and safety experts. Once resiliency testing on the system was conducted, I lifted the ground stop at 9.07 a.m. Eastern time. The FAA's preliminary findings are that contract personnel unintentionally deleted files while working to correct synchronization issues between the live primary database and the backup database. We have found no evidence of a cyber attack or other malicious intent. After the incident, we implemented a synchronization delay to ensure that bad data from one database cannot affect the backup database. Additionally, we have implemented a new protocol that requires more than one individual 
to be present and engaged in oversight when work on a database occurs. As part of our review of the root cause of this incident continues, please know that the FAA will keep the committee apprised of our findings. As you're well aware, 2023 is a big year for aviation. Our current authorization expires on September 30th, and there is sustained energy around, from both industry and government around the development of ideas and proposals to modernize the NAS and the FAA's approach to managing it. As we delve into that reauthorization process, there are several important points we would like to highlight for the committee. Right now, the FAA is managing three airspace systems to serve the diverse users of the NAS. The first is the classic or legacy system that many users still count on. The second is the system that relies on the next generation of technology for improved communication, navigation, and surveillance. The FAA has operationalized the foundational pieces of this system, and we continue to deploy services as operator equipage and federal resources allow. The third is the future, a future that has already arrived. It is the system that must accommodate new entrants in all their forms, including drones, advanced air mobility aircraft, commercial spacecraft, and other new aircraft yet to be imagined. For us to sustain, implement, and plan for all of these systems, we have a lot of work ahead. We look forward to partnering with the committee to ensure that the FAA's oversight and regulation of the NAS continues to deliver the level of aviation safety and efficiency expected by the American public. Before we get to questions, I want to take a moment to acknowledge some of the recent incidents that we've talked about, we've seen throughout the system. I'm sure that you and the public have seen some of the news reports and close calls on runways and other operational events. Because I want to make sure we are giving the right amount of attention to all of these recent occurrences, my apologies, I formed the safety review team to examine the US aerospace systems structure, culture, processes, systems, and integration of safety effort. The initial focus will be to hold a safety summit to examine what additional actions the aviation community needs to take to maintain our safety record. A group of commercial and general aviation leaders, labor partners and others will examine with mitigations are working and why others do not appear to be as effective. I can say without reservation that the aviation professionals who comprise the American aerospace industry are proud of our safety record, but we all know that complacency has no place in air transportation whether it's on the flight deck, in the control tower, the ramp, or the dispatch center. We're confident that we are taking the right steps here, and we look forward to working with the committee and this Congress in developing a long-term FAA reauthorization bill that accelerates the next era of aviation, one that is safe, efficient, sustainable, and open to all. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Director uh, Nolan, and appreciate that. Let's, let's drill down on the no-TAM system. One of the the issues from my, my understanding and you are saying that this involved an individual deleting the wrong set of files. We have a, a backup redundant system. Why couldn't we just go to that system? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. So we do have a backup system. A, a part of how this system works is that as you do updates to the system, as you delete uh, um, outdated NOTAMs, it, it synchronizes across both the primary backup and the other two backups. So part of that synchronization, once we realize and once we come uh, So the structure of the architecture is not favorable to true redundancy. What, which is one of the reasons we're in the middle of this whole modernization effort. We've got so essentially- you're, you're agreeing with me, is that right? Yes, ma'am. I'm agreeing with you that the, we, have eight, we have a 30-year-old system we have a new system. Let me just say to the point, 80% of the users are already on our newer system, which is the federal NOTAM system. We still have some critical users on the US NOTAM system, which is our that this 30-year-old. Primarily, you have DOD, you have the Alaska Aviation in Alaska, and our international users are still on that system. But again, we're working to be off of that system by FY25. So I think, you know, the NTSB is, you know, the authorization bill, we wanted to make progress on this. And so they're basically saying that 
we aren't making progress on this. What What is your response to how we're going to fill, not waiting till 2025? I get that you're saying now, I'm going to back up on the human factor, really is what you're saying. I'm going to back up on the human factor and make sure that this never happens because of an individual, one individual being on the spot. But really, it's the architecture of the system that doesn't give us true redundancy. So is there a way to solve that before we uh, you know, go two years into the modernization? Yeah, we will continue on this journey of modernization. I've asked and I've directed our teams to look at what is our ability to accelerate that timeline? Can we pull it into 2020? I'm asking you, what can you do about the existing system today to yes. give you true redundancy? You're trying to give me human factor redundancy in another individual, but when in reality I'm pointing out that the architecture of the system isn't true redundancy because if the deletion impacted both systems, yes. then, then, it, then you don't really have redundancy. You don't have a separate you know, reboot, you know, our electricity goes off on our house, we go to the generator, if you have one, right? Yes. So in this case, the backup didn't work either because it was affected by the same deletion. So you don't have to answer all of it right here, but uh, I need an answer on this uh, issue of, of redundancy to the system because while we want to modernize and, and we want to have the right resources and we got a pretty good offer from our colleague to drill down with us on the appropriation side to make sure that we have a clear understanding. And I really do think this has been an issue in the past. I really do think that appropriators need to understand the technology needs of the FAA and support them. But what can we, what can we do now to make sure this doesn't happen again? Well, thank you. Uh, several things that we've done. Number one, we have instituted a one hour synchronization delay between the primary database and the backup database. That gives us time to make sure that we have no issues there. Secondly, we've, we've increased the level of oversight to ensure that more than one person is available when work or updates are being done on the live database, along with an upgrading, uh, up-leveling our level of oversight within the command center to ensure that we've got leadership present. So those are, of course, are more in the area of administrative controls, but the work continues to get off of the U.S. NOTAM system yep. and onto the federal I, system. I'm, I'm going to come back at you and ask that you work with contractors to find out how to get us true redundancy in the short term in a backup database that is truly independent and could operate if the same instance happened again. Before I... Um, so in my sense of this near miss with Southwest Airlines and a, and a cargo carrier, was Southwest in a position earlier than their slot? Is that what happened? Well, what happened in, in Texas, in, in Austin, is that uh, something we would not expect to happen during low visibility operation where Southwest was cleared for takeoff and FedEx was cleared for approach in close proximity to each other. That investigation is underway by the National Transportation Safety Board and the FAA. So we're looking at every aspect of it, and we'll certainly provide updates. But it is not something we expected to have taken place. Rightfully so. Uh, the FedEx crew saw the uh, Southwest. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm asking if you have an answer today about why this occurred. No, ma'am. That investigation is still ongoing, but we'll certainly provide an update. Thank you. Senator there. Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Acting Administrator Nolan, the FAA has been charged with modernizing NOTAM for 10 years. Uh, why is it taken 10 years and why isn't it done yet? Well, thank you, uh, Senator Cruz, for the question. Um, we have been on a journey of modernization starting back in 2009 as we began the scoping and we brought on, in 2013, we brought on the federal NOTAM system. So that process, and we've had enhanced them along the way. We are about four years, the substantive part of that modernization. Okay, let, me, let me ask again, why has it taken 10 years, and why is it still not done? That It does take a while. Uh, this is the system, it, the complexity of our NAS. The NOTAMS is just one of thousands of systems that comprise how we oversee the NAS, how we communicate, how we give NOTAMS. And, this is and something I heard you right. Your current plan is, is not to have it modernized until fiscal year 2025, so two to three years from now. What's to prevent another ground stop in the two to three years between now and then? Thank you. 
When I say we're moving to 2025, the work is ongoing. We do have 80% of the users onto the federal NOTAM system. We have added redundancies to ensure that but, the But the 80% of users, if I understand you correct, that didn't stop a ground stop of everybody. Is that correct? It did. When we did a ground stop, that was a ground stop for all departing traffic on the okay, morning. Okay, so, so the 80% didn't help. It's not like it was only a 20% ground stop. Everyone shut down the first yes. time since 9-11. Let me ask you, I, I agree very, very strongly with the questions that, that Chairwoman Cantwell raised about redundancy. And, and do the fixes that you proposed remove the risk of a sing, similar single point of failure for knocking at the NOTAM system offline? We believe the fixes that we have in place today will prevent a recurrence of the event that we saw on January 11th. M Mr. Nolan, you're not answering the question. Will the fixes remove the risk of a similar single point of failure from knocking the system out? Is there redundancy being built into it, or can a single screw-up ground air traffic nationwide? We have, when we think about the age of our system and the age of the systems we have, we do have redundancy there. Could I sit here today and tell you there will never be another issue on the note of system? No, sir, I cannot. What I can say is that we are making every effort to modernize and look at our procedures. In fact, part of this investigation uh, has us working with MITRE and other entities to look at the across the totality of our systems, how they interrelate, what is the level of redundancy, and is there any additional thing that we need to do? And certainly we'll have more as that investigation ensues. Well, I think you're going to see, as you have seen, bipartisan interest in assisting the FAA yes. in ensuring redundancy so that we don't see air traffic grounded again. Uh, and in, in focusing more broadly, I hope, on modernization of air traffic control. I want to shift to the near crashes we've had, and, and understandably, I'm particularly focused on what happened in Austin. Two weeks ago, there was a near collision uh, on the runway at Austin Bergstrom Airport. Uh, a Southwest flight was taking off from that runway. A FedEx plane was preparing to land. They came incredibly close to crashing. I, millions of Texans fly every year. Uh, I have flown on Southwest flights out of Austin literally hundreds if not thousands of times. Um, I actually have a video that was created that is a reproduction of what happened it's a recreation, but it's based on the flight data. So if we could play that video, and I'd like to get your reaction to it. Go. Southwest 708, Roger, you turn right with 80. Yeah, you get it. Southwest 1432, climb maintain 3000, and if you could turn left heading 080. With turn to 0, 0, 3000, FedEx 1432 heavy. So I know the incident is under investigation. It's 14 days to have you, Roger, sir. But if you were sitting on that Southwest flight whistle. and you knew how close you came to having Thank a plane you. land on top of you, killing every person on that plane, you would understandably be horrified. It is only through, as I understand it, the heroism of the pilots being alert and seeing what was happening that that tragedy was averted. And yet, my question is, how can this happen? How did air traffic control direct one plane onto the runway to take off and another plane to land and have them both within 100 feet of each other? And what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen again? Well, thank you, Senator Cruz, for the question. Uh, certainly, we are letting it's, the investigation play itself out. 
uh, having been an airline captain, having been a pilot for more than 42 years, and an accident investigator. We'll go where the facts take us. Uh, what is not represented on the video there, it appears to me, you know, I clear blue in 22 days, what we'd say in, in pilot jargon, but actually it would, the tower visibility was zero, it was a low, low visibility day. It is not what we would expect to have happen. But when we think about the controls, how we train both our controllers and our pilots, the system works as it's designed to avert what you say could have been a horrific outcome. The pilots saw, uh, the FedEx pilots saw... Let me just underscore the urgency of yes, preventing sir. that sort of incident from Absolutely. happening again. Yes, sir. Thank you. Senator Schatz. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Klobuchar. I'm sorry. Oh, Senator Schatz. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, or uh, Ranking Member. Uh, Administrator Nolan, um, and I want to welcome uh, Senator Moran to the THUD Committee um, because I think it's important to note that we did fully fund the, um, the, the budget request for NOTAM uh, modernization efforts in the last spending bill, but there are efforts to cut federal spending. And I want to ask you a very simple question. Should we expect flight delays and cancellations going forward if we defund or underfund these transformations? Oh, thank you, Senator Schatz, for the question. Uh, it's clear, uh, as I said in my opening comments, that as we are on this modernization journey, we are on it with you. So having the funding that we need, and, you know, certainly when we get to places where either we've got starts and stops or we're into CRs, et cetera, it, having that funding there so that that ongoing work can be done and where we have the capability and ability to do, we want to be able to accelerate that. So here, here's my question for you. We do our job, you do your job. If we pass a proper appropriations bill fully funding your request, can you commit to meeting the deadlines and schedules um, already established for the improvements to NOTAM? Yes, sir. We remain on track to get that done. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you've got a bunch of ongoing projects, and I want to talk to you about how you prioritize. You have modernizing NOTAM, next gen, and then integrating um, unmanned aircraft, commercial space launches, urban air mobility technologies. How are you, I mean, the money is one thing, but you also have a throughput capacity problem in terms of leadership and, and, um, and analysis and all the rest of it. How are you racking and stacking those priorities? I, I know you're gonna say, look, we gotta do it all, but in reality, agencies have to prioritize. I'm wondering how you're doing that. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Our first priority, has been and always will be safety and the safety of the NAS. So when we think about things that contribute to the safety of the NAS, that's at the top of the list. And then we think about there's a security aspect and certainly we work in partnership with TSA and other authorities to ensure that our airspace is secure. Lastly, we think about, you know, are not really lastly, but we think about the efficiency. So those pieces of modernization that provides efficiency which the flying public enjoys as well, is those are the things that we work on. So when we think about next gen, what we're doing there, and from a enterprise risk perspective, as it relates to the NAS, that's really what informs which programs and priorities rise to the top of our list. I wanna to move to another topic. Um, NORAD has adjusted its radars to be more sensitive to detecting potential UAPs leading to an uptick in picking up potential incursions. Um, is the FAA adjusting status of airspace quickly as regularly as NORAD may need to respond to incidents? And I guess more generally, um, can you tell us how you're transforming your uh, systems to be integrated into what we know from our national security um, uh, uh, folks and uh, the Department of Defense. A lot of this has FAA implications. Um, I do think, increase, I think increasing the sensitivity of the radars makes perfect sense. I also do think that there may be instances now where we're gonna, you're gonna get a ping on the radar that is a flock of birds or some other um, not particularly dangerous. Um, I, I shouldn't say birds are not dangerous. I'm aware of bird strikes. But the point is, doesn't rise to the national, national security uh, uh, level and so how are you sorting this and what changes are you currently in the middle of um, I don't expect you to have a fully formed answer But I'd like to be reassured that you're working with our partners in DOD to get this right. Well, thank you very much for the question again 
We are indeed. Uh, we coordinate, collaborate, partner on everything that you're talking about. We have a liaison officer embedded at NORAD. We also have DOD folks at our National Operation Command Center. So if you were you to be at the command center, you would see that you've got representatives, certainly from the industry, but you've got representatives from government. We are, we are looking at cyber, we're looking at UAS, all the things that you speak about, there is a high level of, of coordination across the whole of government when it comes to the security of our airspace. Final, final question, the, the, it's been publicly reported, and I don't know that it's true, that, that the, the um, changing the dials on the sensitivities of the radars is something that can be done retroactively. In other words, for the past, that you have data sets that you could actually tweak and then that might inform our national security folks in terms of how many of these UAPs were flying and over what period of time. Can you tell us anything about that? We have capabilities uh, within our command center. We have capabilities in terms of our radar, in terms of what we can see, what we don't see. Uh, again, it's, it's a partnership effort and it's a whole of government approach. The specific to question is, do you have the capability to go backwards? Go backwards, I'm sorry. Could you Go backwards in time and say, look, I want to know in 2018, let's say, yeah. um, uh, the extent of these UAPs by taking the data that you have that probably nobody's looking at, understandably, because it's in the past, and changing the, the sensitivity on the data set, and then that would tell us something about what was happening in the past. Do, do you know if we have that capability? I, I do not, and so certainly I'd be happy to if follow up. you can get back to us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moran. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Nolan, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for the conversation you had with me by phone on January 11th, uh, January 12th. I appreciate that. Um, there has been conversations at the FAA and within the industry whether the agency should change the systems classification from the NOTAM systems ca uh, classification from mission support to safety critical. Uh, comments or thoughts? Senator Moran, thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, that's one of the directions that I've given our team. Let's go back. And so part of the, this look is taking a look at all of our enterprise system, those we consider critical to the NAS versus the support. So we're absolutely taking a look at the classification there to make sure we've got it right. And what would be the difference if it was reclassified? What would be the consequence? Some of the differences are the, just the levels of controls and engineering controls that you'd have in place for a for a critical system, and those that those added levels of redundancy that you'd expect to have, uh, given the criticality of them. Um, Senator Klobuchar and I have introduced the NOTAM Improvement Act. Uh, any thoughts on whether that would be of assistance to you and the FAA? We, we fully support the goals that, that you've both put forward here, and, and I, it is much of what we are working toward. Uh, so we are very supportive of that. Uh, let me uh, talk about a specific technology update. Um, spotlight on FAA's aging infrastructure. Would you comment on the status of replacing instrument landing systems located at hundreds of airports across the country. My understanding at the current pace, FAA's current pace of modernization, it will take more than 100 years to replace those critical systems. We've undertaken a body of work to say, you know, again, I've talked about these three NASAs that we support. And so when you look at that, we'd love to be able to sunset some technology, sunset systems where that have been replaced by satellite, you know, GPS satellite-based navigation. Uh, and our ability to go do that, so we do have a plan in place to see how can we draw down where we have a, more than adequate replacement for that. So that's a, that's a piece of work that we are undertaking. In uh, 2017, I was part of a bipartisan group that introduced legislation that became law. It was called Modern Modernizing Government Technology Act. And it creates a fund for federal agencies to use savings obtained through streamlining, streamlining its IT systems, replacing legacy products and transition to cloud computing for additional modernization efforts. So it allows it as incentive for agencies, departments to utilize take those steps and then they have the money to acquire additional latest technology. To date, that fund has invested in 35 government IT modernization projects across 19 federal agencies. The largest project, uh, project investment was 187 million. 
Considering NOTAM modernization uh, is to, to, the goal is to transition to entirely new uh, platform, uh, has the, if the Department of Transportation, the FAA, has ever considered utilizing that modernization fund to improve NOTAM, and is there a why or why not? I, I certainly have to follow up with you on that question, sir. Perhaps I'm just pointing out there is an opportunity for right. uh, assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Senator Cantwell, um, and thank you for this hearing, and thank you uh, to you, Mr. Nolan. Um, Senator Moran mentioned um, our work on this bill, which I'm going to get to, but I did appreciate you talking to both of us uh, after the two-hour ground stop um, and the work that needs to be done with our air traffic system. Um, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges in strengthening the resiliency and reliability of the system right now? Our focus is number one, is always ensure that the system is operating every day. So every day in our nation's airspace, we have 45,000 flights. So that's just over 16 million a year. And, and we do it very safely, day in and day out. And it, it, we've gone 15 years, 14 years, I'm sorry, without a fatal accident. That's nearly 230 million flights nearly a billion in payments a year. So our system is very safe. At the same time, we don't take that safety for granted. And we recognize we have to continue this journey of modernization. So if I, when I look out and I look for risk, overall, I have a, a, a good sense about where we are. Can I say to the American public that we are safe? The answer is that we are. Is the, if the question is, can we better? be better? The answer is absolutely, and that's the piece we're working on. And so you're looking at transitioning out of this legacy system, yes. and what are your biggest obstacles to do that? It, it's all about ensuring, that, again, that we have that funding there, and we'll look forward to, to mm -hmm. having, you know, what comes forward in the president's budget. Uh, our goal is to take every dollar that we are given, and we are. our goal is to be good stewards of that and move forward to modernization. So we've, again, we're talking thousands of systems. Mm -hmm. um, NOTAMS is just one of, and so we don't want to leave the committee with the impression that we fix NOTAMS and we're done, and I know, you know, you, you know that's not where we are. But we, we'll certainly have a prioritization about how we get there. NOTAMS is a big one. We want to continue to deliver on the, on the benefits of next-gen everything we've done there, even as we stare into the future to say, how do we enable all these new entrants that are coming in? Right. And um, we mentioned, Senator Moran mentioned the bill we have with Senator Capito. Um, and the, the point there is that it would create a task force, as you know, to bring everyone to the table. It actually passed the House, uh, for my colleague's note, uh, led by Representative Stauber of Minnesota. He's got the Duluth Airport up there. And it uh, passed the House in the 116th and 117th Congress last time, 424 to 4. So... I am um, hoping we can get that done and whatever input you have. I think the sooner we do that, uh, the better. And then as we work toward the FAA reauthorization on a separate track. Um, and uh, the last question I'll focus I want to make here is just the workforce issue. Um, we know that every industry practically in America is having workforce issues, including airlines and including you guys. And I know that Senators Duckworth, Thune, Moran, Fisher, Kelly, and many others, the leadership of Chair Cantwell, are working to expand the FAA's workplace development grant programs to boost investments. Um, could you talk about that pipeline of skilled aviation workers and yes, uh, what you think we should do? It's, it's a great question. We look out and say, how do we become a more inclusive agency? How do we really reach out and touch underrepresented group. It is one of our absolute top priorities for the agency. When we think about, I, I know there's part of the narrative, are, are we seeing a younger workforce? The answer to that is yes. Are we attracting the kind of talent that we need? The answer to that is also yes. As we were looking to to bring on more air traffic controllers, we reached out with a, with a campaign of finding that folks who were wanting to be part of the FAA. We were expecting about 10,000, wound up with about 87,000 applications. Um, so we're doing, you know, we're heavily involved in STEM and AVSED. 
and, and our outreach to both universities as well as minority serving institutions are all part of our ongoing effort across the agency and the department to ensure that we that we really lean in, lean in there. All right, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it, Mr. Knoll. Senator Thune. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing. Um, during my time as chairman of this committee, we considered and enacted the uh, FAA Reauthoriz uh, Reauthorization Act of 2018, which included several provisions related to bolstering the nation's air traffic control system and improving the experience of the flying public. And as the next FAA reauthorization approaches, it's essential that modernizing the nation's air traffic control system remains a top priority. Uh, as I've said before, I'm deeply concerned about the FAA's slow progress on NextGen. Despite robust funding for comp from Congress and numerous legislative directives from this committee to complete such an essential modernization initiative in a timely manner. Travel disruptions, especially those related to recent ATC issues and the failure of the NOTAM system in January have only highlighted the critical importance of technology modernization, especially as it relates to improving management of the national airspace system. So I look forward to this discussion and uh, Acting Administrator Nolan, thank you for being here to testify as I previously mentioned, the implementation of NextGen is going to be crucial in the coming years. Um, these investments, as well as employing concepts such as dynamic airspace management, will allow the United States to better utilize existing infrastructure, increasing the capacity and, and efficiency of the NAS. Uh, recent ATC issues at airports across the country have certainly highlighted the need for modernization. So could you describe how FAA is working to get back on schedule to implement the various priorities of NextGen in a timely manner? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Senator Thune. So we continue to work uh, and to deliver on the benefits of NextGen. When we think about the work we've done, again, around navigation, around communication, one of the, a couple of those successes is by going from voice to data, uh, we're, we've been able to eliminate, we believe, over 130,000 misread clearances, and we understand that's a big issue. We continue to work on, we've metroplexes that we have around the country. That's been a big effort, 11 of those in places. When we think about, we have optimized profile descents. So that ability to, to descend out to altitude without the, the step downs that were a thing of the past, those have become more a thing of the past now. That allows, certainly as a fuel saving and it's an efficiency piece. That ability for us to be able to have airlines know when to push off the gate so that you're off the gate and to the, to the runway. All of those are efforts that we are doing and we continue to do. We work closely with the Next Gen Advisory Committee. We got the Advanced Aviation Advisory Committee. We have the Drone Advisory Committee. Uh, and all of those committees inform the work that we do and we are looking, we continue to look for opportunities. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, one of the challenges we face and will continue to face with next gen is that level of equipage. Not everyone is equipped to the same level. And so that ability to take advantage of all that next gen can deliver in the moment in many respects will depend on what the industry has equipped to. So that, that's a challenge for and we'll continue to work through it. So, I mean, and it's, it's just been, it's been a very slow process with lots of delays. And um, I'm concerned that by the time many of these initiatives that you're talking are completed, they're gonna be already outmoded or obsolete in comparison to the latest technology. So what actions is the FAA taking to avoid this issue as next-gen implementation continues? It's one of continued you know, partnership and collaboration. Uh, we are in, uh, ongoing uh, almost on a daily, weekly basis with the airline industry and with you know, partners around the world in terms of how do, we, how do we get better at that. The journey we're on is there and, and airlines, the industry are seeing the benefits of it. There is more work to be done, uh, undoubtedly. Again, back to the equipage piece there, there are just certain things you have to have to be able to do a particular approach, for example. Our ability to sunset some of the legacy systems, some ILSs, NDBs, things like that, now that we have GPS-based navigation, right? So it is our ability to work collectively and have that you know, a, a, a similar vision between us and the industry about what we want to achieve and how quickly we can get there. So as this committee looks toward developing this FAA reauthorization bill, uh, do you believe there are opportunities for the FAA to incorporate adaptive or dynamic 
airspace management technologies into the, its next gen initiative or otherwise enhance real time interagent coordination with the Pentagon and other stakeholders. And I tell you that because we have an Air Force base and a, and a training area, the Powder River Training Complex. Um, and the B 1 currently operates there. Uh, B 21 is coming in. We're going to get the first um, training unit, formal training unit, and uh, first operations unit there. And, and we really need the FAA's help on this. Right. And it's something we've been focused on for a long time. Can you comment on that? Yes, I would say we're, we're strong partners not only with the DOD uh, to ensure that we can work together and that we are aligned. And when we think about airspace and airspace uses, we're a strong partner and we, we, really, we welcome uh, the suggestion and we look forward to seeing how do we do more of it. Well, I hope we can count on your help on that because it has become, a, it's, it's one of the biggest obstacles to um, large force training exercises and the types of, uh, you know, um, capabilities that we can use or, or benefit from uh, in that airspace. So I hope you can help us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Senator Hickenlooper, then Senator Fisher, then Senator Markey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Nolan, thank you for your time and your public service. Uh, as space transportation becomes more common in the U.S., integrating space data into national airspace system operations is going to become increasingly more and more important. Uh, maintaining a safe and efficient shared airspace and, and mitigating delays caused by commercial uh, space launches uh, become more, uh, increasingly more important, as I said. So, Mr. Nolan, can you describe the FAA's efforts to coordinate with the commercial space industry to integrate space data into national airspace operations? Why is the, why is the status of the FAA's space data integration program uh, or what is the state status of the FAA's space, uh, space data integration program to improve airspace safety and, and efficiency? Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator, for the, for the question. We, our work there with the space data integrator is ongoing. And it's certainly already bearing fruits. It has provided us, meaning the FAA, the ability to reduce the, the airspace that we need to block off for, for flights. Uh, this year we saw, uh, last year, I'm sorry, we saw a, a record number of space launches and we're expecting to see at least one and a half time, if not double the amount that we saw last year. So this is a key technology that we're working to make sure that will help us make our airspace more efficient and reduce the amount of closures and the ability to reopen airspace faster. So that's a piece that we're working on. Great. I appreciate that. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, and I have my uh, uh, requisite NOTAM uh, uh, question as well. Uh, at Denver International Airport alone, the NOTAM failure uh, resulted in 800 delayed or canceled flights. Smaller regional airports in Colorado also experienced delays and cancellations, uh, significantly impacting airport operations, airport customers, and commerce. Uh, so, Mr. Nolan, can you describe what technical operational improvements the FAA is taking to make sure this kind of operation disruption does not occur again in those smaller markets as well as the, the large airports? We, we attempt to do our very best job, and certainly we will make sure we'll take away the point about how well we communicate and coordinate. Uh, it should be noted for the committee that uh, on just any given day, every two hours, there is an update from the National Command Center that airports, airlines, and others can tune into. We also have stakeholders who are present in the command center on the floor. So our goal is to make sure that we've got good communication. I do know from my, uh, my team that this particular outage was indeed communicated out to airports uh, and, and, and in a timely manner, but we, we will look for opportunities to say, can we make that even faster and more efficient? Got it. Great. I appreciate that. Um, lastly, the FAA is facing a number of critical issues ranging, uh, including technical upgrades, the new entrance into the national airspace, as I mentioned, <clears throat> growing the aviation workforce, a critical issue, making sure that there's uh, more diversity, more equity in that workforce. Um, based on your experience as acting administrator, what skills and experiences do you think are critical to lead an agency like FAA? Well... You know, I, as we think about that, and whoever leads the FAA, that, that choice belongs to the president. Uh, and I know the president has made a choice, and I certainly support the president's choice in that. Right. I wanted using your giving you an opportunity to do what I'll now do, and just say that I think Phil Rob, uh, Phil Washington, 
uh, who is the nominee to become the administrator, really does have the, uh, the skills and capabilities necessary to really turn around our, our aviation system. Um, he rose to the rank of command ma sergeant major in the, in the Army, uh, 24 years in the Army, and I think he's someone who's used to getting things done, coming in, uh, helping uh, get people all on the same page and, and really focused. Uh, he was the CEO of the Regional Transportation District uh, in metropolitan Denver for almost 12 years and helped turn around a major tra transportation initiative. Uh, and then he's also been CEO of Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority and uh, for a number of years now the CEO of Denver International Airport, the third busiest airport uh, in the world. And I think that array of, of uh, experience, uh, while not all in aviation, is all transportation connected and so many of these same situations are the, uh, come up again and again in, in the aviation sector. Anyway, comment if you want, or I'll just leave it there and say that we need to get uh, a permanent administrator in place as soon as we can. Thank you, sir. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Administrator Nolan, welcome. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, this past week, we have seen NORAB track numerous unidentified objects in the North American airspace. I serve on the Armed Services Committee as well, and I'm the ranking Republican on Strategic Forces, which has uh, oversight over our missile defense. So I'm interested in protocol. And uh, I visited with NORTHCOM and NORAD about that. Uh, but I would like to know if there is any process in place where civilian pilots that detect an unknown object while in flight, um, do, they, do they report the incident to FAA? Do you have any connection then with DOD on it? What are the protocols that you have? Well, thank you, Senator Fisher, for the question. Uh, I'll just relate it, you know, from my own time when I was an airline captain. Uh, yeah, there have been times in flying air where you see a balloon, uh, and certainly, the, typically, as a pilot, you would report that to air traffic control. It, it may be something they already know about, and, and to the extent that they're aware about, I've, there have been times when I've flown where it's, say, be advised that we have a high-altitude balloon, yeah, X distance, X place. So there, it, there are processes in place to report. Um, and then we have, a, a, as I mentioned earlier, an, an embedded team with NORAD. We have strong connections with the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, TSA, et cetera. So there is this whole government approach to protecting the homeland and protecting our skies. And do, as far as you know, those protocols are followed? The protocols for reporting? Uh, it depends, uh, you know, I'm going to say that's, that may be spotty, just, and I, I take that just from my own personal experience. You know, will everybody report that they saw a balloon? Uh, the answer to that is probably no. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. In uh, 2021, Inspector General report, it was cited that the FAA struggles to carry out its role to integrate new technologies and capabilities across various offices within the agency. Integrating new technologies and certification will be a priority as I work on the FAA reauthorization. How is FAA addressing concerns in the IG report in regards to the next gen office and integrating new technologies? I know you visited some with uh, Senator Moran about that and also next gen with Senator Thune, but could you address that specifically? Yes, ma'am. Uh I, I would push, firstly, I would push back against the notion uh, that the FAA is in any way wavering on our mission to make our airspace, which is the most complex in the world, uh, as efficient as we can, even as we embrace new entrants. We have already set in place processes to say, how do we enable new entrants? What is the regulatory framework they will need to operate? and then how we get them integrated into our, our airspace. Is We've, it going as quickly as you hope? It's, it is going with speed, and I think if you reach, so if you can reach out to a couple of the, the air, advanced air mobility companies, they will tell you they feel that we are on step. Uh, it is, this is fairly complex work, and we, what we have said and what we continue to say, technology can never trump safety, and this is one that the public 
expects, and rightfully so, that we get it right. So we are moving. I can tell you, though, categorically, we are moving with a strong sense of purpose to enable these new entrants in the market, and that's one of the things we're, we're truly passionate about. Will you commit to um, working with my office, keeping us informed on the integration of those technologies? Yes, ma'am. I'd be happy to continue to give it, provide updates. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the FAA has completed its preliminary investigation on the recent NOTAM malfunction. Will a more in-depth investigation and assessment be conducted, and will you share those findings with Congress? We do have, we will, we will certainly share as much as information as we're able to, but to your point, and I welcome the question, the investigation is ongoing. So a couple of things there. We are working our Office of IT and Technology. We are working with MITRE to assess all of these systems. Again, we're talking thousands. We're looking at levels of redundancy. What is our, you know, give us a sort of resiliency score, if you will. So that work is on the way. And we're thinking in terms from a safety management system perspective, what are the controls we have in place if they, did they work? What should have been done? What didn't happen? And what are the areas and opportunities for us to improve? Have you got in depth on, on looking at the controls and how quickly they were implemented? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, we've assigned that to uh, a couple of our offices, our Office of Safety Investigations, our Office of Security, to say, again, what happened in the moment. It is pretty dynamic. A lot of things happen that should have happened in terms of reporting, but we certainly look to say, how can we do this better to make sure we don't have a repeat? Thank you very yes. much. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Senator Thank you. Peters. Senator Thank, Markey, Thank you. I had called on him, but Senator Peters was ahead of him, and he's been so gracious to allow Senator Peters to go. So thank you, Senator Markey, Senator Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Markey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Olin, for, for being here today um, uh, before the committee. You know, like many Americans and, uh, and Michiganders, uh, I'm certainly concerned as well by the recent incursions uh, into our airspace of a uh, Chinese surveillance uh, balloon, as well as several uh, as yet uh, unidentified objects, the most recent one that flew across the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, and was neutralized uh, over Lake Huron. Uh, I've been in contact with the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, your agency to uh, monitor these uh, currents, and, I, and I've called for greater transparency uh, into these uh, incidents. So I certainly do appreciate uh, some of your comments that you've made here today about FAA's uh, coordination uh, with uh, NORAD. So I don't want to belabor those points. You've, uh, you've covered uh, those uh, well uh, through the hearing so far. But I, I did want to ask you uh, one thing related to that. Earlier this week, the White House announced the creation of an interagency team to study the broader policy implications for detection, analysis, and disposition of unidentified uh, aerial phenomena, and uh, especially those that could pose potential security risks. So my question for you, does the FAA expect to be a part of that team? Uh, and has that task force actually met and is starting to work? Well, thank you for the question, Senator Peters. Yes, uh, the FAA is part of that team. Our, our COO, Tim Morell, will be our representative on their team, and that team has already met and continues to meet. Good, good. You also mentioned uh, to uh, Senator Schatz, the FAA currently has people embedded in ORAD to uh, improve coordination. Uh, but given these uh, specific events, uh, are, are there any additional bureaucratic or inoperability improvements that you can share with Congress to ensure that these concerning breaches of airspace are, are basically met with a seamless uh, and uh, immediate response? Well, what I can tell you in, in an open forum is that there is a whole of government approach to this from an interagency standpoint to make sure not only that we are aligned on policy, we are aligned on response, that that level of, of coordination is absolutely there. Good, good. Mr. Nolan, Gerald, uh, our Ford International Airport in Grand Rapids uh, in Michigan uh, is the second, uh, is Michigan's second largest airport, over 200 uh, aircraft operations per day, and it serves a, a, a growing part of uh, the state of Michigan. However, even as Grand Rapids serves record numbers of passengers, it's been stymied in its efforts to expand and modernize a, a 60-year-old uh, FAA uh, air traffic control tower. Last year, I secured $5 million in congressionally directed spending for the airport to begin the design process uh, and to replace that tower, but it's still uh, not done. And I would just like to ask you, would you commit to working with me and the Grand Rapids Airport to ensure that the, a plan to replace their tower is done in a timely fashion? 
Yes, sir. What I can commit is we'll definitely work with your staff in terms of I know there's work that's ongoing there. We'll commit to giving you regular updates on it and, and what our progress is. Great. Well, thank you. The, uh, the Unmanned Aerial Systems Beyond Visual Line of Sight Aviation Rulemaking Committee uh, has published its report in March of uh, 22. The report laid the foundation for, uh, for providing regulatory certainty to stakeholders looking to uh, safely and swiftly deploy and scale uh, unmanned aerial systems. However, the FAA's rulemaking agenda notes that a draft rule for UAS deployment outside the visual line of sight isn't expected until February of 2024, 23 months uh, from the report to the draft rule. Uh, and that's, as you know, not even an, a final rule at that point. Uh, between the long wait for this rulemaking and uh, difficult to navigate current exemption and waiver process, uh, I'm afraid advancements in commercial drone industry have stalled, uh, frustrating communities in states like Michigan who are looking to take advantage of this cutting edge uh, technology and economic opportunity it re represents. So my question uh, for you, Mr. Nolan, um, uh, what, do you commit to doing everything you can to ensure that the U.S. maintains its global leadership in advanced aviation? And certainly uh, uh, this type of aircraft uh, represents the future, and we need to lean into making sure we're facilitating that. Well, thank you, sir, uh, for the question. Let me say the U.S is and remains the world's leader when it comes to this type of technology. To date, we've licensed over a million drones. Our projections are that we'll have 2.5 million by FY25. So we are working uh, with respect to beyond visual line of sight. Uh, we stood up an aviation rulemaking arc uh, and a committee. We received thousands of, uh, of, of reports. We are going, in, of comments, if you will, we're going through the process of going through those. But in the meantime, as even as we're doing that, we have things like waivers and exemptions that we're using to enable UAS operations, some of which we've already done. So we will commit that this is, again, part of our top priority for, for our drones, for advanced air mobility, to make sure that we stay the world's leader. Good. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. Senator Markey and uh, Chair Cantwell, thank you. Thank you, Senator Budd. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Nolan, welcome. It's Thanks, good, to, good to chat with you earlier. And You know, I was listening to a colleague from across the aisle a few minutes ago um, from Colorado, and, you know, it struck me how much I appreciated your aviation experience, your service to our military. You know, it, it would just make sense. Common sense seems not so common anymore, but, you know, it would just make sense that somebody leading the Federal Aviation Administration would actually have aviation experience, so I appreciate the experience that you bring to the table. You. you know, on the morning when this issue occurred, in exchange between air traffic control and a pilot at Newark Airport, sums up some of the broader issues with a NOTAM system that go beyond this specific outage. ATC was talking uh, to an airplane that was, or to a pilot of an airplane that was taxiing out for departure and told the pilot about the nationwide ground stop. ATC asked the pilot if he had heard anything about the NOTAMS issue before departure. The pilot responded, no, nobody reads NOTAMS. Well, maybe that's because the NOTAMS system is not designed in a user-friendly way. The FAA's new federal NOTAM website, it's a little better, but it does not prioritize important NOTAMS and it delivers it in a printed code that is optimized for teletype machines instead of plain English. I'll give you an example, as you would know. Um, so I, I've printed this out. No environmental impact study was done before, but uh, I printed out the NOTAM from the federal NOTAM system for a flight from DC back to my home airport near Winston-Salem. It's a 90-page document for a simple flight about an hour long. If I didn't review the list closely, I might have missed the NOTAM for a runway closure in my designated alternate airport. The NOTAM, it's buried on page four somewhere in here, uh, between 13 other runway and taxiway NOTAMs. So, uh, Chair, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent that this briefing be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you. You know, pilots can consult other free resources provided by the FAA, like LIDOS, uh, flight service, that system does have a summary of important NOTAMs, like temporary flight restrictions or TFRs. 
and runway closures, but that system missed the runway closure notum on the summary page. Here's the summary page, and it doesn't have that important notum. So I would have had to find that runway closure notum on page 53 of a 276-page briefing. So Mr. Dolan, aside from the issues faced last month, what is the FAA doing to bring notums into the 21st century? Well, thank you, uh, Senator, but for the question. Uh, this is exact. You know, again, you're in a, we, we share that we're we're both pilots, so we operate in our in the nation airspace here. This is part of our modernization effort. We committed that we will align our NOTAM with the ICAO standard, that we will make them timely, we will make them relevant, and, they, and the ability to prioritize by, as you say, by by route of flight. So that's a part of the work is ongoing. Where we are today, we're, you know, call it halfway there. We, you can, they are searchable. You can find the ones that are relevant to your, your flight. But this is the one we've just got to do better. And that better means getting off of the, the U.S. NOTAM system onto the federal NOTAM system. And the last part of that is ensuring now that our NOTAM systems comports to the ICAO standard. Thank you very much for that answer. So it, it makes sense to have flight restrictions around major games like last weekend's Super Bowl or, you know, the upcoming Daytona 500. And those TFRs are announced well in advance and cover much more airspace to provide appropriate security for those special events. But stadium TFRs and the exception of those TFRs, they seem designed to trip up small planes flying VFR. So, Mr. Nolan, are you aware of any instances where a three-mile, 3,000-foot TFR thwarted a threat from the air? I am not. Okay. Well, Mr. Nolan, my time is short, but again, I want to just, again, thank you for what you bring to the table, for your expertise in the aviation field and your leadership of the FAA. As a pilot myself, I'm glad that a fellow aviator is at the helm of this important agency, and I hope that we can get a permanent head of the FAA that has a deep understanding of the issues facing aviation today. Thank you so much, and I yield Thank you, back. sir. Thank you. Senator Markey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your service, sir. Um, obviously, um, the outage of the NOTAM system just shows how fragile our aviation system uh, has become. Um, and we heard in testimony last week that Southwest Airlines suffered its own operational uh, meltdown due to inadequate amounts of winter equipment, which was exacerbated by its own limited technological system. Um, Southwest told us that they didn't have enough de-icing equipment in Chicago or in Denver, which is like saying you don't have enough baseballs to open uh, the season at Fenway Park. You know, so, uh, so obviously they didn't anticipate what um, was unfolding, uh, and a lot of it is as a result of climate change, as a result of global warming. Um, Burlington, Vermont, for example, uh, in a report out just this past month, but it's a good example of what's happening across the country, is seven degrees warmer in the, w in the winter than it was just 50 years ago. Burlington, Vermont, seven degrees warmer. So it's not just global warming, it's global weirding that's taking place. And therefore, you have to adjust, adapt the system to the craziness of the weather. And the aviation system has to make the investment in order to deal with this dramatically changing weather environment due to global warming, due to climate change. So there is a dangerous connection between climate change and outdated technology and infrastructure with extreme weather events like Winter Storm, Elliot, stressing the IT systems at the core of our aviation system. So, Administrator Nolan, do you agree that climate change poses new challenges for airlines, airports, and the FAA? Senator Markey, thank you for the question. Um, just given my, my long time uh, airline experience, I, I can say, number one, I've operated in all kind of conditions. I, I, the airlines, when we think about how they operate, this, they all have what they call winter operation plan. I, I'm not an expert on climate. I, I certainly believe we there are things we must do to continue as we think about what we- Do you we, think you have to become an expert on climate? Do you think the aviation system has to become expert on climate? What do you think? 
I, I think absolutely. The more we know, the so, better. So we're let's. So so that's what I would yeah. like to hear. I would like to hear that there's an understanding, appreciation. Yeah. You know that if you're not an expert, other people have to be experts. Okay. We um, do have ex. We do that have that level of expertise within the agency itself, I, and that's I think it's very important because we're going to obviously have to harden our aviation systems against extreme storms, heat, and other weather events. Um, do you think that um, the FAA uh, needs to require an, a greater investment in resiliency at airports? That's certainly the path we're on. And so, we, you know, and that's a wonderful way of describing it, right? It is how resilient are our systems and the extent to which we build that in, bake that in. Certainly, the industry globally is investing in technology to be more resilient. And that it is an absolute priority for us. Yeah, and I'm, I'm working on legislation to improve the resiliency of our aviation system, particularly at our airports. Uh, we worked hard to uh, include $25 billion for our airports in the bipartisan infrastructure law. But these critical investments uh, will be wasted if we don't address the climate-related risks. And we're just going to have to work together in order to make sure uh, that they're not in denial about what is happening. Um, and just one final point, which is uh, related to airport resiliency, which is airport service workers. Um, these individuals are the unsung heroes uh, of our aviation system, but they often are overworked and underpaid. And just as our aviation system literally came to a stop due to no TAM outage, our airports would similarly stop functioning uh, if the airport workers, the wheelchair attendants, the concessions workers, ramp agents, baggage handlers did not do their jobs. So I just think it's absolutely um, essentially that we recognize, and you do agree, they're the essential to keeping these airports functioning. I do indeed. Yeah, and I think it's important for us, which is why I introduced um, uh, the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act, which would ensure that airport workers um, are paid a living wage and benefits. Uh, they're underappreciated, underpaid, undersupported. Uh, they're black, brown, immigrant, uh, disproportionately. Uh, and during the pandemic, they showed up. They couldn't Zoom to work. Uh, and we just have to make sure they get the resources which they need. So thank you, sir, for the thank you, sir. you do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go to our next uh, member to ask questions, I just want to clarify that the video that we saw earlier was a simulation done by Senator Cruz, I think, and his team that was not a real exactly. video of the incident. There seems to be some confusion about that, so... Uh, no, no, ma'am. I, I knew it was a simulation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I, you clearly stated that, but yeah. not everybody Got may have captured that. Right. So we just want to reiterate that. Um, we next. I have Senator Vance. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Nolan. Thank you for being here. You. Um, I did not realize that. I'm going to ask just a, a little bit about thank you. Thank you. some of the. Uh, the unusual increases in obsession with the vocabulary and language that we're seeing in some of the FAA guidance and uh, you know, re related documents related to our aviation industry. Um, I want to ask, did the FAA issue a 176-page guidance document changing uh, notices to airmen to notices of air mission in December of 2021? We did. This was in part to avoid using the gender term airman, correct? Yes, sir, I believe so. Okay. On November 10th, 2021, the FAA held an inclusive language summit. Are you familiar with this effort? I am familiar with it. Okay. During the summit, which had a solicitation published in the Federal Register, Deputy Administrator uh, Mims stated that when we use terms like airmen or unmanned aircraft, sorry, I'm laughing because this, this has to be a joke, we're sending a message that only men belong in the aerospace community. Do you agree with that statement? Well, Senator, what I could say is that having been a pilot for 42 years and seen the evolution of our aerospace industry, I started out in helicopters and have flown as a captain in big jet liners. Sure. Not everyone is a pilot today. We have drones, we have spaceships, uh, spacecraft, I'm sorry. And so, I, I do believe going to notices to air missions 
is absolutely the right thing to do. It is an accurate reflection of where our airspace system is today. Fully supportive of that. And none of that, by the way, detracts from our mission, which is the safety of our airspace. And that will always be our North Star. Yeah, I think the point of is, if it makes sense for some aviation reason, that's fine. If it makes sense purely to avoid gendered language, it seems like an unnecessary preoccupation with the words that you're using and that we're using rather than the work that we're doing. Uh, I want to just ask a couple of additional questions about this, this summit. The public notice uh, for the meeting stated, if any individual employer, contractor, or industry partner feels excluded or marginalized because of language or words, the work of the agency suffers. Do you agree that the feelings of FAA employees about language are this important? What I agree is that as we seek to attract the next generation of people into aerospace, mostly they won't look like the people sitting in this room. And so it's our ability to say, how do we bring tomorrow into today, into an industry that is evolving right, right before our eyes? So our ability to find inclusive ways of reaching underrepresented groups is a right path to be on. Okay, I'd ask you unanimous consent to enter into the record the Drone Advisory Committee public ebook. I have it right here. This document uses the term wife as an example of the type of language that we need to eliminate. Is that something you support? I'm, I'm sorry, could you restate the question? I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, I just said, so I, I'm asking unanimous consent, first of all, to enter this into the record, but, but it, it explains that wife, the word wife, uh, is an example of the type of language that we need to eliminate. And I'm just asking if that's something you think is necessary or something you support. I'd have to give that one some more thought. I... Uh, well, <laughs> I would hope that the word wife is not something that we, or, or is something that we can all agree is a reasonable vocabulary word that most Americans use in their daily life. It's not something that we need to eliminate. Um, I, I don't have much time here. So, I would just ask here, um, at the same summit, the, the, during a panel called How the FAA is Pushing Gender Language Boundaries, a panelist stated that FAA leadership brought us to where we are here today. We see the recommendations from the committee as a foundation, but it's also just the beginning of the conversation. It strikes me that preoccupying ourselves so much with the words that we use rather than the work that we do, especially as our infrastructure appears to be crumbling and we've had major flight outages the last couple of years, is at best a distraction and at worst um, a, a thing that takes attention away from focusing on, on the real problems. Uh, I, I, I worry, when I, especially I represent the people of Ohio, and I'm very confident that the majority of Ohioans, if there is a pilot who is offended by the word wife or the word cockpit, maybe that person shouldn't be a pilot. So rather than kotoing to people who are fragile, maybe we should actually say, if you're so worried about the words that we are using, you shouldn't be flying um, you know, multi-ton metal engines through the sky. Uh, and I just ask all of us to maybe try to focus as much on real problems, like the fact that our aviation system seems to not be working as well as it used to, uh, than the fact that we may use uninclusive or under-inclusive language. Uh, thank you, Mr. Senator Nolan, I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Administrator Nolan. Uh, thank, you. thank you for coming before the committee. Um, and I know you'll be back uh, again, um, although that will not stop me from going beyond the stated topic of this hearing. But I'm going to start with the stated topic of this hearing. Um, so the, the NOTAM failure happened right on the heels of uh, a uh, a, a failure with uh, Southwest Airlines. Uh, we had uh, Southwest uh, leadership uh, uh, testifying last week about their meltdown it, uh, during the holidays. And um, I want to raise a similar concern for the FAA that I raised uh, with Southwest. Um, when something goes wrong and flights are canceled or delayed to the degree that they were during both of these situations, Airports need to hear from you. Um, they need to hear, in, in the case of Southwest, from Southwest. I learned from several Wisconsin airports, they just did not receive any type of proactive communication from the agency about the impacts of the NOTAM failure. Um, they only received information necessary to respond to confused and frustrated travelers 
um, after reaching out you know, themselves to FAA's local uh, regional office. It's my expectation in situations like these that FAA should provide proactive and real-time updates and guidance to our nation's airports. Can you commit to that uh, moving forward and tell me how you would approach that should we ever have a failure like this or similar uh, uh, disruption um, that requires this type of communication? Well, Senator Baldwin, thank you so much for the question there. Uh, but let me say, just to, to set the record straight, Throughout the course of every day, there are industry calls from our National Command Center every two hours. In addition, on the January 10th, we, we also open up a hotline at 8 p.m. on the night of January 10th, and we had anyone could call into that, meaning airlines, airports, and other users of the system. So, so that was open, and then we were talking with our industry stakeholders throughout the night. On the following morning, when I instituted the ground stop, that information also went out nationwide to all airports. And we have roughly 5,000 airports in the country. Um, and so all of that. And, and as well, our office of airports also reached out to provide updates on the NOTAM outages uh, that morning, early that morning of January 11th. And, and certainly, we also updated that uh, once the NOTAM was canceled. But your point is well taken. We will go back and just scrub to say, can we even improve our communication process? And we'll commit to you that we'll do just that. I appreciate that. Um, I, Congress uh, took action in the last FAA reauthorization, or the 2018 FAA reauthorization, to move airports away from firefighting foams that contain PFAS. Um, yet, airports are still without any approved alternatives. Um, airports in my state are eager to transition um, away towards safer alternatives and are anxiously awaiting uh, an approved alternative from the FAA. I will note that there are now numerous communities in Wisconsin whose uh, groundwater has been contaminated with PFAS, um, and they are, in many cases, immediately adjacent to an operating airport. Um, I am aware that the Department of Defense, which has a strong role to play here, of course, recently released a military specification outlining its requirement for firefighting foams that do not contain PFAS. So given that update, what can you tell me and what do you see as the likely timeline for finally giving airports PFAS-free alternatives? And how does the agency see its role in assisting airports throughout this transition process that we hope will be forthcoming? A good question there. Um, we are still working through that. So our Associate Administrator for Airports is on point in terms of working through this issue of PFAS, we recognize as one of supply as we look to an alternative. As you mentioned, the new mill spec is out. Uh, air, airports are allowed to use for an actual emergency, and then we've got procedures where they can test without discharging PFAS onto the ramp and, and you know keeping that from getting into the water tables. So we're working through the process of how we get there. We recognize it, it will take us some time. What I can commit to you is we'll follow up with you with your staff in terms of what that, those actual timelines are as they become available to us. I, I, I just would uh, want to uh, stress and, and press for, uh, for uh, all due but considered speed on this. Um, the, resources that we are committing at the federal level to try to um, assist communities uh, with uh, getting a clean and safe water supply after contamination are in the billions. Um, and uh, we shouldn't be prolonging this in any way. Um, so uh, I, I certainly want to uh, uh, press for um, uh, you know, timely action on this. I know at uh, the local uh, uh, fire department's um, uh, fire department level, which obviously is different uh, than um, uh, uh, aviation firefighting, 
but they are uh, finding uh, various firefighting foams that are working very effectively that do not contain PFAS. It seems to me that those test that that testing um, can be happening at the federal level and and get something in the queue as soon as possible. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Senator Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I have a couple questions, and I, you may have addressed this already, um, but I do want to ask because uh, I get a lot of questions about this from back home. So you were aware of this the night before on the NOTAM failure in January. We were, but, the yes. pub, but the public was not made aware until the next morning, right, including when people were sitting on planes uh, and flights were delayed. I mean, there was no real transparency with the public. You would agree with that? What I would agree with, sir, is that we the system on the night before was operating and also airlines were not reporting that there were any operational impacts on the night of the 10th. Okay, so how long until uh, you knew that this actually wasn't working until the public knew? Okay, go ahead. Um, so first thing I wanted to check with is, do you um, any of the outlet? I think that was uh, one of our colleagues trying to- That's okay. Can I have my in line 10 seconds back? Yeah, just sure. kidding. <laughs> Right. Um, uh, okay. I I just want to move on to something else. So, in in the president's budget that has been submitted, um, there is two point four million dollars advo- or uh, a proposed to address climate change. In the conclusion of that budget, it says, and I quote: "The FAA's budget request for FY twenty twenty three embodies the administration's priorities." of mitigating climate change and increasing equity. Do you believe that that is your mission at the FAA to mitigate climate change and increase equity? Is that your job at the FAA? I believe it's all of our jobs are to address climate change and it's one that we take seriously. Okay, in that, in that report, there's further commentary about it um, as a response to the accelerating climate crisis. Do you believe we have a climate crisis I was just at the ICAO convention where the majority in an overwhelming fashion supported moving to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So if you look out across the global community, it is one that's staring us in the face and it is one we must address. Yeah, I'm not really interested in the global community's view. I'm interested in the FAA's view whose mission is supposed to be safe and affordable travel for the American public. Uh, and what I've noticed with agencies, and this was particularly heightened in COVID, and I think is now the playbook, we went from global warming to climate change to now a climate crisis. And as you've indicated, words matter. And in my view, that is meant to stoke uh, fear and empower unelected bureaucrats to do things that are not authorized by law because it's a quote unquote emergency. And so I have deep concerns with spending $2.4 million on, uh, it's not really clear, but I want to read you something from this. It says the FAA, this is the same budget request. The FAA will need to continue supporting maintenance and implementation of ICAO's carbon offset, offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, Corsica, the international standard. Corsica is a market-based measure that allows international operators to to achieve carbon neutral growth through the use of carbon offsets and sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, Is the FAA currently supportive of Corsica? Uh, Corsica, yes, yes, sir, we are. And we are supportive of our move to sustainable aviation fuels. Okay, Uh, I am distressed uh, and troubled that the secretary, Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg, is not here today. Uh, Do you know if Pete Buttigieg, when he flies private, uses that same system, that same measurement of Corsia? Well, first, let me say, sir, that what you speak of is private or government aircraft that are used across the government. We use aircraft for testing. The FAA has a fleet of 42 aircraft that are primarily used for en route testing, et cetera. Uh, and so, and those, without having to sort of qualify this, uh, we are talking about public resources and not private resources. 
Right. It, it, does he, does uh, the secretary use market-based carbon offsets when he flies private? Sir, I can't speak to that. Can you get back to me on that? Because I'm very interested. Or maybe actually if you could get the message to the secretary that next time we have a hearing dealing with the Department of Transportation, the FAA, we'd like to see him here and if he could give an answer to that. Because he flies, flies private a lot. He tells hardworking Americans they need to pay more for things that he's not willing to pay for and people are frustrated. So could you relay that message to him? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As a senator from the great state of Illinois, where we produce a lot of ethanol, my farmers are very supportive of the aviation fuel, um, sustainable aviation fuel movement. Um, as a pilot, and, and we both actually started off as Rotorhead, so welcome. It's, it's good to see a fellow Rotorhead, and, and I know your background um, in Aviation actually also includes a long history in aviation safety. Yes, ma'am. Um, all the way back to your days as an Army pilot. Uh, one of the things that you learn is that a safety system should never be left vulnerable uh, to a single point of failure. Never. Redundancy saves lives. We know that. That's why I am very alarmed that a single contractor could crash the automated NOTAM system um, by simply deleting files. Uh, that sounds like a single point of failure to me, and I would love to uh, understand it better. And, and this is on the heels of the deadly Boeing 737 MAX crashes that were caused by the grossly irresponsible decision to place passengers' lives at risk at the mercy of a single angle of attack sensor. What's striking about these incidents is that America's largest commercial aircraft manufacturer and the world's most important aviation regulator both betrayed a fundamental aviation safety principle operational redundancy. It's the FAA's job to keep our airspace safe, but it is impossible for FAA to do this unless its systems have appropriate redundancies, and you generally have redundancies across the system. Uh, Administrator Nolan, when was the last time that the FAA reviewed its air traffic organization's facilities and equipment to ensure that there are no potential single points of failure? Well, thank you, uh, Senator Duckworth, and uh, I, applaud you for your service as well. It's great to talk to a fellow Army person. Um, let, me just, let me just say, we have an ongoing look in terms of where we are. So the whole journey of modernization for the FAA is exactly to what you're describing. How do we continue to build in redundancy and resiliency in the system and expand it to be able to accommodate new entrants and what we have today? That work is ongoing. What, 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 but what was, the, what was the last time before the NODEM system crashed that a review was conducted? We, we did reviews in uh, 2020, 2021, and we've done three reviews uh, in 2022. I would love to um, see any reports from those reviews, if possible. We'll certainly follow up with the Thank you. The Boeing 737 MAX investigation discovered that at least one employee specifically cautioned against relying on a single angle of attack sensor in the, uh, in the airframe. But that concern went unheeded. Um, how often, if ever, are you briefed on concerns that FAA employees may have about the resiliency of the air traffic organization's facilities and equipment? Do you get those briefings? Do those come up to you at your level? We do. Uh, we have several processes. Certainly, we have a whistleblower program. We've got a for our safety uh, organization. We have a voluntary safety confidential reporting program. So there are multiple avenues for FAA employees to get information to me. I have a bi-weekly with my audit team uh, in terms of- and they anything. lift up, they lift up individual? They do come to me for individual reports. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go into my next question, just simply because I have um, a limited amount of time. As you know, last week, Airlines for America urged FAA to extend its proposed deadline to June 2024 to retrofit aircraft with altimeters that won't experience interference from 5G wireless technology. While a four-month delay may not be a huge disruption, it is a reminder that this process has been and remains a seat-of-the-pants operation. Had the FAA and FCC better cooperated during the development of 5G, wireless customers would have benefited from a smooth, predictable rollout of this new technology without risks to, their, to air passengers. Instead, we were treated to delays, negotiations, and uncertainty, all because the FAA and the FCC failed to meaningfully collaborate with each other early and often over the years. We should never have reached a situation where the FAA had to seriously consider halting flights at, a cert at certain airports because it could not rule out the risk of 5G interference causing a crash, 
even if such a risk was low. I have um, uh, several questions I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to submit for the record. Um, but really, you know, I, I, what I need to know is, is the FAA receiving all the technical information it needs from the FCC and the wireless carriers to ensure that 5G does not interfere? Does the FAA have the resources that it needs to ensure that um, all passenger aircraft are equipped with the technology to prevent 5G from interfering with flight operations? And this is both commercial but also general aviation. Um, is the FAA sharing all relevant information with FCC and air carriers to prevent 5G from interfering with flight operations? So I have a series of questions I'm going to submit for the record, and I'd ask for you to uh, please submit your answers in writing. Thank you. We'd be happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Capito. Thank you, and welcome, Mr. Nolan. Thank you for your for your service and, you. and long years of service. Uh, let me ask just a quick question. Is, your, uh, is the FAA workforce in the office five days a week now? Uh, no, ma'am, they're not. Do you, have, you know how that breaks out? 20% are? I, I don't have the numbers. I'm happy to follow up with you on that. But do we do have, we, we've got folks who are in the office and there's coverage every day. Let me qualify that. Our operational people are indeed in the office every day or, you know, in the control rooms every day. Do you uh, anticipate the rest of the workforce will come back every day? We are working through, I believe, across all of government to say as we come out of the backside of the pandemic to make sure that we've got that tempo. What I want to make sure for the American public is that the, what the work we do is accomplished no matter where the person is sitting. Understood. Yeah. I, I would hope everybody would eventually get back there. Yes, um, as you know, and I think this was addressed, Senators Klobuchar and Moran and I have introduced the uh, NOTAM Improvement Act, uh, S-66. I think you've addressed this, establishing a task force of experts to come up with recommendations to make the important pilot notification system better. Um, while I know you've been trying to improve the system for years, can you tell us the benefits of having this legislation and assembling these experts with a clear list of uh, objectives and deadlines to, to give recommendations? Could you address well, that? Well, thank you. What I can say about that is we support we support the goals of this legis legislation, uh, and we're working in, in that level. We are working with industry stakeholders. Uh, we work with an earlier group when, as we started the journey of modernizing our notice, and notice system. Do you think that having that uh, stronger NOTAM system would cut down on the uh, 1,732 runway incursions we saw in 2022? I, I certainly think getting to that advanced system, prioritizing all the things that we've talked about here this morning, will make the system more resilient. And so I'd love to see us get there quicker. Um, uh, let me ask you this about contractors. Um, we've noticed that, uh, and we've, uh, you, you noted, cybersecurity are a major issue. Uh, and uh, we're also concerned that, uh, as Senator Duckworth was talking about, the contractor unintentionally deleting files, causing the outage in, on January the 11th. Uh, you stated that new protocol requires more than one person to be present when database work occurs. Can you tell us how many contracts have, have contractors have access to the NOTAM system? And does the other person that needs to be present, is that an FAA person, or is it could, uh, could they be a contractor? Uh, yes, ma'am. So let me say, firstly, uh, for the contractors that were directly involved in the unintentional deletion, they no longer have access to either FAA facilities or the NOTAM system. So we, we do have other contractors. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but happy to follow up there. And we also have a level of FAA oversight. And so part of so the... So it could be either or. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, there will always there is always FAA oversight. Okay. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you a question about 5G. We've had hearings in this committee uh, on the um, uh, issues between the FAA and the FCC. Uh, and, and I know Senator Duckworth is going to do some questions for the record, but what is your communications uh, strategy with the FCC on this so we don't run up against another deadline and have another hearing and then everything seems to break down? Uh, thank you for the question. We are working very closely with the FCC and the NTIA, as well as the industry, on all things 5G. We've got a regular cadence of meetings with the FCC on this, and, and we are in a position where we have better alignment, and we've got an absolute sense of transparency going there. Well, I would encourage that. Uh, let me ask you a question coming from a rural state with smaller airports. Uh, what would you say the biggest challenge moving forward the next 10 to 20 years is going to be for our smaller regional airports? I, 
what the, what gives me uh, you know a lot of hope is as we start to see uh, advanced air mobility. I mean, it, it really excites me, and that ability to not only go between cities but to co connect smaller cities as well. When we think about urban air taxis and what the possibilities are there, I I, I think it's fascinating to be quite honest. We we continue to look at how you know that what's that level of support. I can't speak to the economics of it. That's not my within my purview. Uh, but we are a strong supporter of our system. We look for ways. How do we support, certainly, from a uh, Federal Aviation uh, Administration? Thank you. And I would like to just uh, thank you and your representatives that are, that are in West Virginia. We have a lot of contact with them. We have some, um, you've, you've probably flown into West Virginia. It's, I have. It takes a little bit of skill, I think. And uh, uh, in some cases, a lot of skill. So uh, they are very responsive to us and, and reply and, and help us. Uh, in, a, in a short period of time. So uh, I please convey my uh, uh, appreciation for that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the feedback. We'll certainly pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. So my intention is to ask a follow-up question, and if anybody else shows up, we'll give them an opportunity to ask a question. If they don't, we're going to close out the hearing and yes, move on. But, Mr. Nolan, I, I, thought, I found it very uh, concerning that the same day we had this no TAM system issue, so did Canada. Yes. Now, I just feel like this can't be a coincidence that we have no incidents, and then on the same day, the same system has a problem in two different countries. Do you know about the Canadian outage, and what is your make of this situation? Yes, ma'am, I do know about the Canadian outage. We have talked with our counterparts at NAV Canada. Uh, absolutely, there was no connection between what they experienced based on everything they told us and what we experienced. That being said, one of the very first things I directed our investigation teams to do to look at this from both a human error, but also from a cyber. We also have Department of Homeland Security working with us to look what is our level of cyber resilience there. So again, the investigation is ongoing. Everything we have to date showed no sign of this being cyber related, but the investigation still continues there. And so, what is what was the perp, what was the outage in Canada? What was the theirs was in a my understanding from them theirs was a a database but they they have a different system different architecture it was not related to our system in in any way shape or form i'm sure it wasn't related to our system but i still find it ironic that two you know the biggest systems in the world are outed at the same time and there's been no problems with these no tam systems and all of a sudden on the same day there's a problem it just uh, i think yeah we'll look forward to more uh data and information uh, from you on that. Back to the question, though, on redundancy. I don't think we have true redundancy here. So I want to see a plan from the FAA that examines the fact that the backup systems are still subject to the same kind of, uh, if you want to call it human error, mm -hmm. of deletion of files. You're building a system to try to firewall that from not happening again. But it could be a different problem, and we still have a backup system that would be affected. Mm -hmm. So until we get the true modernization system, I would like you to go back and see what level of redundancy that you really have a truly separate system that would not be impacted by this. We, we, we appreciate the concern, and that is indeed one of the first paths I directed as well, is to this this overarching look by our IT team working with MITRE is to do exactly what you're asking for. And so, and so what did you come up with since you you went down this road sooner than I did? What did you come up with? Wait, that, that is still ongoing. They've got, they've got still a bit to do because, you know, as I said, we've got thousands of systems, and so our ask for them is to, once that work is done, we'll certainly be happy to, to provide, provide an update to the committee. You mean we have contractors with too much stuff and they can't get things done? Is that what you're saying? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. No. So why why can't they give us an analysis of the system and keeping a duplicate system? Right? That's that's the, the the body of work that's ongoing. It's not just the NOTAM system, but I think what you're asking for is looking across all of our critical system that, that underpin our national airspace and the levels of redundancy there. That's the work that we have, yeah. our IT and MITRE. No, I'm asking just now about oh, the OTAM system. Yeah. I want to get an answer within a week 
about the NOTAM system having a separate backup, totally separate backup that could be used. You're saying what happened here is somebody infected the file and basically ended up deleting something that then caused the outage to the system. So the question is, you're now trying to put human redundancy there so that this won't happen again. But if the same system is a network, including the backup uh, servers and other places, and whatever action somebody mistakenly takes on files still affects the whole system. What would be uh, important to understand is, can the FAA set up a true redundant server system that would allow for that file corruption that happened not to happen across the entire system? And that's what we need to know the answer to. So I do see a few colleagues have arrived, which means we, we have some questions to answer. So I'm going to go and vote, and I will turn it over to my colleague from Wyoming, uh, Ms. Lummis, and then uh, my colleague from Georgia, uh, Mr. Warnock, and then we'll see who else uh, shows up. But thank you very much, thank Senator you, Lummis. Thank you, Chairman Cantwell. Um, this is an important hearing. We appreciate your being here very much. Um, looking forward to your testimony today and your willingness to start serve and continuing this important dialogue. Uh, before I go to my questions, I want to highlight several issues that I believe should be at the top of this committee's priority list as we look to reauthorize the FAA. Uh, obviously, um, there's no doubt that both the Southwest and the NOTAM system failures uh, have shown the need for a reliable air service ecosystem, both in the public and the private sector. But I must note that reliability of air service is an issue that my home state of Wyoming faces every day, whether there's a system outage or not. Uh, factors such as a lack of pilots, high jet fuel prices, a consolidation of air carriers, and the upgaging of aircraft capacity have left many rural communities across the country at risk of losing their air service. Uh, so as we move into this FAA reauthorization, uh, this committee must not lose sight of the main goal of our national aviation policy, creating a truly national network uh, that safely connects all regions together. So I'm looking forward to uh, the discussions today. Um, Acting Administrator Nolan, it's my understanding that many in the aviation industry feel that no TAM system does not provide useful information. I happen to be sitting on an airplane when no TAM went down uh, and the pilot was trying to explain to us what no, no TAM does. Uh, often air crews are bombarded with information, some of which is critical while others are repetitive or even irrelevant for the specific route the aircraft will be flying. As the FAA looks to recover from this outage and modernize the IT infrastructure, I'm curious to hear if the FAA has heard similar concerns and if there are plans to simultaneously modernize NOTAM so that it can better prioritize the information it is sending to air crews. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, what I would say, so two things. Number one, the journey that we are on, and we're about halfway through it uh, in terms of our modernization of the NOTEM system, is designed to do exactly what you are describing and what the general concern is. How do we ensure that the NOTEMs delivered to pilots, being a pilot myself, uh, are relevant, they're timely, they're prioritized, and they uh, speak to the route of flight. Now, there are times when you might have to divert, so we can't always say they're irrelevant. You know, if you're deviating around a weather system, sometimes that could take you hundreds of miles off your present course, and there might be a relative, uh, a relevant notum there. Um, but we are moving. We've already got some functionality built into the system today, especially on the federal notum system. And by the time we get to uh, 2025, when we'll have everybody onto the federal notum system, we'll continue to improve that. And following that, we will ultimately get to an ICAO standard. All of that takes time, of course, but we are working through it very purposefully. So how would it work um, if it's a more localized 
uh, issue. For example, I've been on planes uh, in Wyoming where there were antelope on the runway mm -hmm. or a coyote on the runway. Uh, so it only affects a few planes uh, in a very localized area. Can NOTAM be uh, calibrated to address those sort of very isolated individual issues? Yeah, so maybe to speak a little bit about NOTAMs, right? So for your flight that you're on, departure, yes, you've got NOTAMs that are appended to the flight plan if you're on a commercial flight. But the other thing you do as a pilot is you would call for the uh, DATIS, automatic terminal uh, information service, which gives you weather, which gives you taxiway closures, which gives you other things relevant that may not be working in the moment. And the same thing for your route of flight and the same thing for your destination airport. Pilots, you would call prior to top of the descent and say, what's happening at my airport? Uh, it may say it's in Bozeman, Montana, or it's in you know, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, right? That, those are the in-the-moment um, types of information, relevant information you would get from the airport itself. Our goal is to, again, to continue down this journey of uh, streamlining the NOTAM system, making it ICAO compliant, and getting it to a point where it is indeed relevant to each route of flight. So uh, recently you announced that uh, upgrades to the NOTAM system would not be completed for almost a decade. Um, and I as, assume it's because of the complexity of making the updates. Is, but is there a way to expedite that time frame? Yes, that's one of the, one of the directions I've, uh, I've given my team is uh, come back to me with what it would take resources wise for us to accelerate. We love to see if that's possible. Right now, we substantially, the bulk of the work will be done by uh, FY25. I, I'd like to see if we can bring that forward, and then there are some other pieces that work into that. Okay, one more quick question. I understand the FAA has taken steps to prevent another NOTAM malfunction, such as decoupling the system and requiring that two people be presented uh, when performing work on the system or be present. Uh, since the issue with NOTAM was caused by contractors accidentally deleting critical code, does the FAA plan to restrict access to the NOTAM system moving forward to FAA employees? No, ma'am, we do not. So we have a NOTAM system that is overseen by the FAA and maintained by contractors. These folks are indeed the experts there. What I have ensured that we have is the level of oversight for our FAA team and that the requisite level of leadership that oversees that. Thank you very much, Acting Director Nolan. We appreciate your being here. Um, I yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Senator Warnock. Far be it for me uh, to go ahead of the gentlewoman from Nevada. Thank you, Senator Warnock. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for being here um, today uh, for this really important hearing. I'm just going to go quickly right into it because uh, for Nevada, of course, uh, you know, big tourism destinations all up and down our state, robust, safe, and reliable air travel, it is, like I said, essential for our tourism-driven economy to thrive. In 2022, passenger volume at Harry Reid International Airport, it broke an all-time record. The airport welcomed more than 52.6 million passengers. And while business travel, of course, still recovering in 2022, leisure travel to Las Vegas exceeded expectations with visitors drawn to our newly expanded sports offerings. I'm just saying Super Bowl next year, Las Vegas. Uh, and other large-scale entertainment events. And the NOTAM systems outage last month, it did make clear to um, actually all Americans how dependent the world's largest economy is on air travel and how dependent air travel is on antiquated computer systems. Fortunately for our Harry Reid International Airport, the immediate impacts of the outage were manageable as we have amazing and dedicated employees and the NOTAM, uh, NOTAM outage happened on a Wednesday, which is actually one of our lighter travel days. I worry, however, about this happening again and our ability as a nation to deal with it. So I wanna talk about preparing for a cyber attack. 
uh, the incident spanning January 10th and 11th was determined not to be a result of a cyber attack, but it did publicly really reveal critical vulnerabilities, um, like some of the other senators have mentioned, in our security and our system architecture, and um, we just have to continue raising these concerns. So do you feel, in your estimation, that the FAA systems, that they're resilient enough to detect, to counter, and defeat a major cyber attack, um, including by other nations, uh, nation states, and does the FAA, do you have the proper infrastructure and, most importantly, the properly trained cyber workforce to swiftly support that effort? Yes, we do. Uh, so thank you for the question, uh, Senator DeRozan. Uh, we, all, we have a ver very capable uh, cyber resilience staff. We undertake biannual cyber response plan, and we when we... Um, uh, practice that plan uh, on a biannual basis. We work in close concert and coordination with our other agencies, TSA, Homeland Security, et cetera, and we continue. And, and certainly the work of modernizing the FAA, which is an I was going to ask, what investments are you planning for? What can we expect to see in the coming months um, to maintain this level? Well, certainly we want to get on to the federal NOTAM system that, that has increased levels of redundancy versus the U.S. NOTAM system, but we still got some critical users who are using the U.S. NOTAM system. So that's the work that will take us to get there. But, but back to the question of, of cyber resilience, we are, we look forward to that, and we think the controls we have in place will prevent a repeat of, uh, of the event that happened on January 11th. And Thank you for that. And I want to ask, as we move forward into IT modernization, not just in this area, but in, in really every area, we have to do that. Um, how are you working with other federal agencies to manage and prevent cyber threats? And is there something that um, we can do, any congressional support you need in order to be sure that those collaborations are taking place? I would say at a high level, I know the committee has been briefed on many things in and around cyber. Uh, currently, uh, well, it's been a while, but we have a whole of government approach to that. So we are working across every agency and every department within the government around cyber, around cyber resilience. That there is that level of interconnectivity is absolutely there, and okay. it is one of our top priorities, one of the top priorities for the administration. And, and I want to build on that a little bit because uh, we know that uh, we're using telephones as a backup, right? And so like the outage again in January, the flight crews, they utilize this backup phone system. Now, I would say that's, uh, I, I love my phone, and, but I would say that that's not the best use of our technology. And so considering the added time requirement, the potential for error in, inherent in uh, using uh, outdated rudimentary system, um, is it sufficient that a phone is the reliable backup in 2023 to the NOTAM system? And, and what can we do to have a, have a more reliable backup? Well, a phone is, is there are multiple streams uh, of getting NOTAMs. One is by calling, one is talking to air traffic control, one is talking to facilities that you may be going to or, or in route. So, so we, that backup, that, that's there. Uh, our goal is indeed to have a system that is highly resilient and redundant, and that's the piece that we're working toward. Thank you. Thank you, um, I think I yield to, uh, I'm going to yield to Senator Sullivan from yeah. Alaska. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Nolan. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, my state has very unique problems and yes. challenges. 258 communities with no roads. Think about that. 82% of the communities of my state, you can't get to by a road, so you need an airplane. And yet we have the oldest infrastructure and technology of any state in the country when it comes to FAA uh, issues. We have remote mountainous terrain. We know it presents technical challenges for the FAA in installing and maintaining robust communications and navigation and satellite systems. In the FAA's own words in 2021, the FAA Alaska Aviation Safety Initiative they said, quote, maintaining the extensive Alaska National Airspace infrastructure, which consists of a mixture of old and new components, is a daunting task for FAA engineers and technicians. Now, I know we're focused on modernizing the NOTAM system, um, but can I ask you, 
Will the FAA, with the FAA recognizing the huge needs in Alaska with this Alaska Aviation Initiative, which we appreciate from the FAA, are any of these going to be addressed in the effort to modernize the NOTAM system? Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Sullivan, thank you so much for the, for the question. Yes, indeed. Uh, we recognize the criticality of our, our systems with respect to Alaska and, and all of the challenges that you, that you spoke to. Uh, and Alaska is, is still one of the areas that remain on the U.S. NOTAM system. So that's a part of our goal as well. When you think about Alaska international operators, some parts of the DOD, is to get everybody onto the federal NOTAM system and, and you know, that will happen by 2025 unless we can accelerate it. And we're looking at what that might take. Okay, will this effort then re result in more timely, um, w in more timely NOTAMs on outages of navigational aids and communications? So will you be able to be able to surge that capacity that we need there? That's our expectation that we'll have, you know, better uh, stream better reliability there. Let me ask more specifically, what is the FAA focused on in terms of doing soon to address the challenges to maintain navigational aids and communications equipment in Alaska and then upgrade it? We're still working through that. I mean, there are things we're doing like around runways, around approaches. We've done a lot in terms of GPS approaches. We've got some, you know, some, uh, other approaches, other approaches that we are doing in Alaska. So our commitment there is high, and everything that we're doing via FASI uh, is working, and it's it's we're making the kind of progress. Okay, again, I, I appreciate the FASI effort. Um, I mentioned 350 communities, oldest technology. I also mentioned, unfortunately, you know, highest death rate per capita in terms of flying for all these reasons. Can the FAA? This is a simple idea store more spare parts in the state and provide more technicians? Well, thank you for the, uh, for the idea, sir. Let me, if you would allow me to take that back to our team, and we're certainly happy to follow up. Okay, good. Let me ask one final question. I know we have a vote here. I want to be respectful to my um, colleague, Senator Warnock. Um, the FAA has a policy that we're kind of baffled by right now um, that is requiring and to be honest, I still don't even really understand it, uh, shorter runways throughout the state of Alaska. That is antithetical to what we need right now, which is actually longer runways. Remember, these communities, the airport is off, is the only thing that connects them to, right. unless they're on a river, and then it's a boat, but the river's frozen in the winter. So why are we... Why are we requiring, in order to be eligible to reconstruct runways using um, federal funds that the FAA is forcing Alaska to shorten the length of its runways? To be honest, you should be helping us lengthen runways. This is baffling to me, and my team has tried to explain it to me, and I don't understand. So what what is happening? This is nuts. Well, thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, let me just caveat, uh, correct a couple of things here. Uh, there is a, a caveat in the AIP funding that, re, you know, that requires, when, you, when we talk about an additional 500 feet is what we're talking about, we are working through in, in NOATAC, if I've got that right, Alaska. Yeah. So that work is in progress. There is, it's also caveated that if it provides critical services. Or how about there's no road to that. There's, exactly. So those are things that play into that. So that that piece is underway. Well, I'd like to work with you and your team, with my team, to make sure we're not <laughs> we're not telling Alaskan communities they got to shorten the runway when yeah. it's their only lifeline to the rest of the state and the rest of the world. Yeah. Okay. You, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much, um, Administrator Nolan, for being here. Uh, families rely on the FAA to ensure their flights will take off safely and efficiently. Uh, the FAA's NOTAM system plays a critical role in this effort, and its recent outage is concerning, to say the least, as many of my colleagues have already said, and, and unacceptable. I think you know that. Um, it doesn't just hurt passengers. It also poses a national security risk, signaling to our adversaries 
that even a minor computer error can bring down domestic commercial flights for hours. According to your testimony, this outage resulted from a contractor accident, accidentally deleting files that were necessary to maintain the synchronization between the live and backup NOTAM databases. Administrator Nolan, as of January 10th, uh, and if you can answer yes or no, I've got to go and vote. Uh, they're always doing multiple things around here, or we're always doing multiple things, I should say. Uh, did FAA staff understand that deleting these files could cause this outage as of January 10th? Uh, there was an understanding. If the question is, did they understand the, the result of deleting files? Yes, the administrator knew that it was an unintentional deletion. Uh, and so as they were working to re to repair that error, uh, they did understand the magnitude of what they had done. How, how many contractors had security permission to access and delete those files that day? How On that many? day, uh, the contractors all had, so let me say, our NOTAM system is overseen by the FAA and maintained by contractors. They were our database administrators. Uh, so they had access, the ones directly involved in this event on January 10th and 11th and no longer have access to our system while the investigation is underway. So, and we're taking a look at that. So, so how many had access that day? That day, I don't have an exact number. At the, that day, there were two people working in the system. So can, can you follow up with me and answer in, in writing? Yes, sir. Uh, how many contractors had, had access that day? How many contractors still can disrupt the database connection? If we think about it, whether it's a contractor or an FAA employee, our goal is to build in a level of resilience no matter who is in the system, and we've put controls in place to make sure that we had the levels of redundancy with oversight, ensuring that two people, more at least two people, are there when working on the live database. So you're saying the answer is zero now? That the answer is zero, I'm sorry. On uh, how, the, question. the question was how many contractors still can disrupt the database connection? And you're saying to me that based on systems you've put in place now with redundancies, that answer is now zero? We would expect, that's right, with oversight, we would not expect to see a repeat of this kind of error. Um, so, and, and, and thank you, if you'd follow up with the first, the answer to the first question yes. in writing. I believe it's essential that FAA avoid single points of failure, which I, I think I'm hearing you say that that should not happen right. again. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so, so no one contractor who hasn't had their morning coffee can accidentally or intentionally uh, ground commercial air travel for the whole country. How many other single points of failure does the FAA have within its system? That's a piece of work that we are undertaking. So part of the effort that we have going with our Office of IT and Technology working with MITRE is to assess the totality of our systems of which there are thousands to make sure what we have from a resilience perspective. And we expect uh, that work to be completed here in the coming weeks. So right now we don't know how many other single points of failure uh, we have within our system. And, and that's work you're doing right now. That is work that we are doing now. All right. What, what steps are you taking to audit security and access permissions across all of these points of failure to prevent both accidental mistakes and malicious intruders? This is a part of what the investigation uh, is designed to do. We're looking at every part of our process from procedures, from access, from control, from resilience to redundancy. All of that is in scope of the investigation. Well, uh, obviously all of us were, were deeply troubled by what we witnessed, its impact on air travel, uh, and the implications are, are deeply concerning. This year is, uh, of course, FAA reauthorization. It's a good time for us to be focused on these issues, and I look forward to collaborating with you and with my colleagues as we modernize uh, the FAA to increase security, uh, to reduce risk, uh, so that all of us, uh, certainly my uh, constituents in Georgia, people all across the country can, can fly safely. We appreciate the support. Uh, so I guess, no, oh, the chair is back. Well, Senator Warnock, thank, do you thank have you, a, Madam further Chair. questions? I am done. Okay. I'm going to go vote. Well, maybe we'll uh, coordinate here together, but thank you. You represent such a big aviation state and look forward to working with you on the reauthorization bill.
Administrator Nolan, thank you for your participation. The hearing will remain open for four weeks until March 15th, 2023. Any senators that would like to submit questions for the record should do so uh, two weeks from now by March 1st, 2023. And we ask the witnesses to, witness to respond by uh, March 15th, 2023. So with that, our hearing is concluded.